Last week, we were dealing with the question of, is there a God? And um, not only that, but why is it that we Christians think we're right and everybody else is in, in, in the world is wrong? So here's what everybody ought to think about. Why do I believe the things that I believe? Somebody was critical last week and they said, it's all faith. Yes, that is correct. It's all faith. You're going to believe something by faith or you're going to believe something else by faith. Why? When I was in high school, I think the single most valuable lesson I ever learned was one of my religion teachers, my senior year of high school, taught us that any belief we had that wouldn't stand up under questioning is not worth having anyway. The Bible is not saying, oh, uh, just believe, uh, uh, don't ask questions. No, the Bible commands us to ask questions. It says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they're of God. By contrast, you look at something like the Quran that says, this book is not to be doubted. God's not scared. Check him out. So we're going to do that. We're going to examine why is it that we Christians believe that we're right and everybody else is wrong. We're going to look at the reasons behind our faith. We don't have blind faith. We have educated faith. Yes, it's faith, but it's an educated faith. So remember, something I showed you last week, since all of us are going to die, I would presume you want to know what's on the other side. If there's no God, there's no way you could know. But if there is a God, the question is, what kind of God? Is it a God that could communicate clearly, a personal God like Christians and, and Jews and Muslims believe, or is it an impersonal series of forces as Hindus and Buddhists and people like that believe? If it's an impersonal God, of course, an impersonal force can't communicate anything, so you still couldn't know. But if there is a personal God, then you ought to ask, well, did God try to communicate with us? Are there any books in the world that claim to be a revelation from God? If there were not, you still couldn't know anything for sure. But if there are, which ah, I'm giving away a little bit, there are three books in the whole world that specifically claim to be divinely inspired. So since that's the case, we ought to find out, is there a way to test any such books to see if they're beyond human capabilities? If there was no way to test them, we still could only say, well, that's what you believe, this is what I believe, that's true for you, this is true for me. No, truth is truth, whether I believe it or not. Falsehood is falsehood, whether somebody else believes it or not. So we ought to find out, is there a way to test these books? And you're going to see, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the other two, the Quran and Book of Mormon, but we are going to look at the Bible to find out, yeah, it stands the test that it really is the Word of God. And backtracking just a little bit for those that were not here or those that weren't watching on the Internet, scoffers will make fun of us Christians because we believe in a God that's invisible, supernatural, eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, and self-existent. But we saw last week that they have to believe in an impersonal series of forces, which you could call random chance, evolution, quantum fluctuation, anything you want. But this series of forces has to also be invisible, supernatural, eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, and self-existent. That is, there has to be someone or something that has all of the characteristics of God. You have to believe in something. There's no possibility God does not exist. The question, though, is, is it a personal God or is it a series of impersonal forces? And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So, of course, if your God is a series of impersonal forces, as the Hindus believe, then your God can't communicate. Forces can't communicate. The basic idea behind evolution, which the theistic evolutionists, I guess, don't realize, but the basic idea is we're going to explain absolutely everything by purely natural processes. When Darwin was writing his book, The Origin of Species, he wanted to explain every single thing by natural processes. And there have been many other honest evolutionists that have said the same thing. They said, I'm just not going to allow God in at any point. So the basic idea of evolution is we're going to explain everything by purely natural processes. And the atheists say this is because there is no God. The theistic evolutionists, I guess, don't realize they're just jumping on the bandwagon with the atheists because they say, well, the atheists are smart and I don't want to look like a fool, so therefore I'll, I'll agree with them. Now, on the other hand, if you're somebody like me, you would say, no, I think that there's a supernatural intelligence, that is God, that created the universe, and I think most things are explained by the natural processes that God set up, but there may be some things that are not back at the beginning, and of course God hasn't forgotten how to do miracles. 
So if somebody challenges you or challenges me to prove there is a God, I don't need to. This is something I accept as being self-evident. I say it's obvious that there is a God. They say it's obvious there is not a God. They challenge you, prove there's a God. Well, prove there's not. You can't prove God. You can't disprove God. You have to look at the universe around you and decide, is it more reasonable to believe in a God or in a series of impersonal forces? So, of course, if you've decided that it's natural processes only, you have no choice but to believe in evolution. On the other hand, if you believe that there could be a supernatural being that started the whole universe and maintains his ability to intervene at any time, you'd have to say, yeah, I guess God could use evolution if he wanted to, or he could have created just the way the Bible said if he wanted to. If you will once admit that there could be an all-powerful God, you'd have to say, you know, I guess the Bible could be right. So the basic idea behind evolution is absolutely everything must be explained by purely natural processes. And here's my analogy. Absolutely every dog barks. Fido is a dog. Therefore, what do you have to conclude about Fido? Has to bark. But is your first statement, all dogs bark, really true? No, of course not. There's an entire breed of dogs, the Basenji, that don't bark. Or he could have throat surgery. He could be bashful. He could have a cold. He could be depressed or something like that. But not all dogs bark, therefore your whole argument breaks down. Well, likewise, Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. In other words, if something is a physical phenomenon, then it has a physical cause. How many things would you have to find out that don't have a physical cause to falsify evolution? Just like one non-barking dog, one physical phenomenon without a physical cause. So the atheists are just up in arms about the possibility of even mentioning intelligent design in classrooms. They say, that's unscientific. Well, uh, teaching the possibility of intelligent design versus the impossibility of intelligent design is a matter of philosophy. It's not a matter of science. So the evolutionists make up all sorts of stories because they refuse to admit that there could possibly be an intelligent designer in nature. So they have to come up with stories to explain where matter and energy came from, and they believe in a Big Bang. We've got 91 elements known to exist in nature. You have to come up with some way that those came into existence. We have to come up with a way that the most disorderly explosion of all time could produce an orderly universe. We have to come up with a way for the stars to appear, the solar system, including the sun, the planets, the moon. How could life have originated? We reproduce by means of DNA, and we also use something else called RNA. Where did that come from? That wouldn't have been there at the beginning. We also, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but every single cell that you have is made out of something called amino acids, Every one of those has a possibility of existing as a right-handed or a left-handed form. Well, if you just put together a whole bunch of chemicals in a laboratory and slosh them around and you're able to make amino acids, you get a 50-50 mix of left-handed and right-handed. So what do you think the percentage is in you and in every living thing? 100% left-handed, 0% right-handed. It's so very different from what happens according to natural processes and here's the latest buzzword. A buzzword is a, a technical term used by insiders to let each other know, hey, I'm in on this. The latest buzzword in biology is pathways. We've discovered the pathway to the evolution of the Hox 43 gene. That means, hey, I got a good made up story. Listen to my story and let's see if we could make these creationists believe it. So they'll talk about the pathways to the development of various kinds of genes and structures. And then, you know, there's an error correcting mechanism in cells to prevent errors from taking place, to prevent evolution from taking place. You've got to come up with some way to explain the origin of that. Is that all? No. You know, you can make up a good story about any one of these things. But how many non-barking dogs does it take? If any one of your stories is wrong, then you have just falsified all of evolution. So here's some more of those made up stories. Supposedly the very first living thing didn't even have DNA. But later on, DNA somehow evolved, and the lowest bacteria and so forth have a few million of these things we call nucleotides. And we have about three billion 
and the lily has about a hundred billion. You know, a lily has 33 times as much DNA as we do. Why did Jesus say, consider the lilies of the field? Why did he pick them? It's almost like he knew something, huh? They have more DNA than anything else does. So how are you going to add all of these chemicals, these nucleotides, just by accidental copying mistakes, you're going to go from three or four million to a hundred billion just by copying mistakes? Well, they're going to have to make up some kind of a story to that effect where, let me continually interject, on the other hand, I think there's a God. I think there's a supernatural intelligence that's responsible for all of this. Then even the very, supposedly the very earliest plants dated 3.5 billion years, blue-green algae called stromatolites. They're identical to modern blue-green algae. They forgot to evolve in 3.5 billion years, and they were photosynthetic. There's a complicated process of photosynthesis where the sunlight comes in and it goes through all of these steps. And if you ever watch a video of it, which maybe I'll bring in some day, sometime, it's like a, a factory. You have this does this, then this does this, then this does this, then this does this. Okay, now these are supposedly the earliest life forms known, and they acted just like the modern ones. So the evolutionists have to make up some kind of story about where photosynthesis uh, came from. And then there's two main kinds of cells. One has a nucleus, one doesn't have a nucleus. Nobody knows how you got the nucleus. And then the earliest living things supposedly were one cell. Well, we're not one cell. We're trillions of cells. Elephants are trillions of cells. Somewhere along the way, you had to make a jump from one cell to billions of cells. There's nothing known that has two cells or four cells or eight cells or anything like that. It's just either one or bunches and bunches and bunches. We're going to talk about irreducibly complex structures. Um, Every major type of living thing, you have to make up a story for that. Sex, you've got to make up a story for that. Why is it that somewhere along the way, the worms, which didn't take care of their babies, evolved into um, amphibians, which didn't take care of the babies, which evolved in reptiles, which didn't take care of the babies, and oh, hey, all of a sudden, some things started taking care of babies. What physical change would make that happen? Where did humans come from? Why are we conscious? Why are we not just a bunch of chemicals just kind of lying there? Why do we have a sense of morality, religion, humor, and so forth? I saw a really funny video by John Cleese of Monty Python's Flying Circus, and he was poking fun at the evolutionists. They try to explain absolutely everything by purely natural processes. In his video, he comes out as a scientist with this model, and he says, we scientists have now discovered the location of the gene that makes people believe in God. It's right here, and he says, it's right next to the gene that makes you want to eat coconut ice cream. And then he goes on for a while and he says, and over here is the gene that makes you want to not believe in God. <laughs> to, he was joking, of course. But the evolutionists have to come up with an explanation for everything. And how many non-barking dogs does it take? If any one of their stories is false, then evolution is falsified. Dr. Francis Crick, co-winner of the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the structure of DNA, said, Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Why did they have to keep that in mind? What does it look like? Sure, it looks like it's designed, says this Nobel Prize winner who's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. He says that life had to come from outer space. Aliens had to send it to Earth. Because he refuses to believe in God, you don't have to repent before aliens, but you do have to repent before God. So Dr. Crick says this, and let me paraphrase, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Let's look at some of the reasons we might believe that things are designed. Down here we have armadillos. The guy that wrote the book that I'm referring to, Michael Behe, Darwin's Black Box, lives up north, and he refers instead to groundhogs. So let's do armadillos. Everybody knows what happens to an armadillo when it tries to cross the road, right? <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the road? To show the armadillo it really was possible. Suppose that an armadillo is trying to cross a thousand lane superhighway and the traffic is whizzing by. And let's say he's got a 50 50 chance of making it across any one lane. Okay, somehow he makes it across the first lane. Wow, his chance is now, instead of one and two, it's one and four that will make it across both lanes. Probabilities multiply. By the time he gets to 10 lanes, it's not one in 10, it's one in a thousand. By the time he gets to 20 lanes, it's about one in a million. 30 lanes, about one in a billion. 40 lanes, about one in a trillion. Is there any theoretical barrier that says he absolutely can't make it across? No. no. But will he? No. 
No, we recognize just as a, a matter of practicality that extremely improbable things don't happen. This is one of the best arguments for non-randomness in nature, that is for design in nature, the improbability of structures arriving as a result of just random processes. So in any collection of matter, there's no one arrangement that's no more or less improbable than any other. Somebody's going to win the lottery, probably, maybe. Um, of course, you guys, when the state of Louisiana was first coming out with the lottery, does anybody remember they had this song they were doing? Play, oh, play, oh. You all remember that? It's a takeoff on the Jamaican song, day, oh, day, oh. Well, I, I carried it a little further with the lottery. Play, oh, play, oh. Politician gonna take your dough. You never find out where the money go. Well, anyway, uh, somebody's probably gonna win the lottery, but, and that's just a random thing, but suppose the same person wins the lottery week after week after week after week. You'd say something's pretty odd, right? Okay, and Mount Rushmore, of course, is a purely random arrangement of stones, right? Yeah, there was a recent addition to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, in nature, most arrangements, equally probable arrangements, produce meaningless junk. But there are some that are meaningful, and all of a sudden, hey, this thing is alive and it's functioning. So our question is going to be, how improbable is it that the specific arrangement that is alive could arise as a matter of chance? Here's another thing that my teacher that taught us about questioning our beliefs also taught us. If there's something that's a high probability, its opposite, of course, is low probability, well, you don't stop there. You say, okay, how about the next thing? Low probability times low probability, the next thing, 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 the next thing. If there's a bunch of things that are extremely improbable, then the probability is that the opposite is true. All of those things I showed you are just the tip of the iceberg, the things evolutionists have to make up a story for to try to explain where did it come from. They're very, 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 very improbable, like the groundhog trying to get across a million lane superhighway. But you couldn't say absolutely it couldn't happen, but any reasonable person would recognize that's not going to happen because the probabilities converge. The more you have probabilities converging that this is not random, the more you have probabilities converging, this is designed. And if it's designed, ah, oh, it must be an intelligence. Hmm, must be some sort of a personal God, not just some sort of impersonal stories. So remember, the evolutionists have got to be true on every single one of their stories because if any one of them is false, you got your non-barking dog. The judges that have fallen for this line about intelligent design is not scientific because it requires some intelligence, some outside intervention. They've obviously never studied biology. I took an ecology class one time where we were studying the location of anthills on a levee. And the anthills, um, if things were just purely random, there's a test that you do, it's called a chi-square probability test. When you're working with biology, ecology, and so forth, you do these tests, and it's a common thing, it's an ordinary thing. And what you're looking for is, is distribu distribution random or not? And you can tell. Random will give you, here's where the anthills are going to be located. So we went around looking for the anthills and we plotted their location. We said, it's not random. How do we know? Because this is done all the time in science. We don't know why it's not random, but it's not. There must be some unknown influence that's driving it away from randomness. So the ants are choosing to pick these locations. Did I mention anything about God or religion there? No, this is a standard thing in science. You look for probabilities of randomness, and if it's not random, then you may look for something that's the non-randomizing influence, or you might just leave it at that. That's really what intelligent design is. Intelligent design doesn't go as far as I want to. It just says, you know, it's not random, which implies that there may be some intelligence. So people that say, oh, that intelligent design is not scientific, they're going to have to throw out a great deal of science, especially when it comes to biology and ecology. Probability testing is a standard thing. So let's think about some things uh, to see whether they're probable or not. That's a, a drawing of a DNA strand, 
and I've got a few dozen pairs of those chemicals I talked to you. They're called base pairs when you put them together. But DNA in human beings goes on a whole lot further than that. That's a few dozen. DNA is three billion of these things. And DNA consists of four chemicals that are reused over and over in varying sequences. But I want you to notice something. See how it, it has the same swirl all the way? Its backbone is these sugars called deoxyribose. That's DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So never mind that stuff, but it's sugars. Sugars in nature can have either a right-handed twist or a left-handed twist. So I asked the teacher in this ecology class I was taking, wouldn't it be a valid application of a chi-square probability test to examine DNA? It's three billion of these units long. Every single one of those guys is right-handed. Not a single one is left-handed. I asked him, wouldn't it be a valid application of a chi-square probability test to see is DNA random? He said, oh. I guess so. Yeah, it's off the charts. This is the most non-random arrangement of matter you could imagine. Now, of course, if your mind is firmly made up, I just absolutely refuse that there could even be any kind of a god, any kind of an intelligence. You're still going to make up stories. But come on, if you are a reasonable person, you look at that and you say, that's not random. Which means, oh, there's something outside of randomness, or maybe someone outside of randomness responsible for the whole thing. <coughs> Well, DNA does a lot of stuff. It has the mechanism in it to continually repair the cell, to maintain the cell, including itself. It also has the mechanism to reproduce. And this is a really cool thing, I think. DNA has got a whole lot more information in it than it needs. So the question is, how probable is it that this would have happened by random chance? You could take one strand of human DNA, and you could put enough variation of genes in there that you could produce every single human being who's ever lived by the combination of genes in Adam. Because you, you got your DNA from your mama and your daddy. They got it from their mama and daddy who got it from the mama and daddy who got it from mom and daddy. Go back to Noah, Noah and his wife and the sons and the wives. Go back to Adam and Eve. Where did Eve get her DNA? From Adam. When God planned Adam, he put so much more information in him than he needed to because he knew about you know, 7,000 years of, uh, from now, I'm going to want Dave to come along. I'm going to want Rusty to come along. I'm going to want Vic to come along. I think this is so cool to think that God was planning me when he made Adam. And he was planning you. So when Jesus said he even knows the number of hairs on your head, Jesus wasn't telling the half of it. He knew the number of hairs on your head before the foundation of the world. And when he made Adam, he put the genes in Adam to make sure he had the right number of hairs on your head. Wow. So is DNA a random thing? Well, you know, if you want to believe that, I have some oceanfront property up in Utah I'd like to have you take a look at. But then the evolutionists still insist that it is random. A few other things about it. DNA uses this system to make proteins, which are the components of cells. They're supposed to have had no DNA at all. And then the DNA evolved later on by accident. And it experienced so many accidental copying errors that we went all the way from amoebas and bacteria up to human beings and things that have more DNA than us, like lilies and sharks. But along the way, this is just all an accident happening over and over and over, a bunch of accidents, a bunch of accidents, a bunch of accidents. And DNA is getting more and more and more and more and more and more elaborate. However, Every single type of organism known uses the same manufacturing system for proteins. Your cells are made out of proteins. The proteins are made out of amino acids. Proteins, that's the key. You use this process involving endoplasmic reticulum and transfer RNA and messenger RNA and um, a bunch of enzymes in the DNA that unzip it and rezip it and so forth. You use exactly the same mechanism that an amoeba does. Wait, the mechanism forgot to evolve. The very simplest thing in evolutionary terms uses exactly the same manufacturing system as the, very, as the most complicated thing, the most advanced thing. But yet, why did our DNA change so much, but our manufacturing system didn't change so much? It's a very well-designed system. It works throughout nature. So again, if you want to believe 
that one thing evolved all this way and the other one just absolutely didn't do a single thing as far as evolution, you're free to do that. But don't claim that it's science. It's faith, faith in blind chance. Whenever you, um, any one of your cells has to reproduce, why doesn't it make a whole lot of copying mistakes? Well, if you look into the details of this, you'll find out there's a three, at least three levels of error checking in your cells that serve to prevent evolution. So first, you have a, a fit between certain types of chemicals in there, and I don't think you want me to go into detail on that. But secondly, once you fit these things together, the DNA, in order to make a new cell, you got this strand of DNA. It's called a double helix, like the threads on a screw. It unzips. Each half is then able to go about being the, uh, the template, the, the guide for a new cell. Well, every now and then, there could be a mistake that slips in, and so you've got a messed up cell. Yeah, but there are these little lifeless chemicals called enzymes that go along the two halves of the DNA strand, the new half and the old half, and read it. And they find out, uh uh, uh we got a problem here. No, 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 fix it. And these lifeless chemicals know, let me snip out this thing, get it out of there, put in the right thing, and this brings the rate of errors down to about 1 in 10 million, and it's not finished yet. You keep going past there, and there's a final step using DNA polymerases and proofreading exonucleases and all of this kind of stuff. And these things go along and they reread one last time to make sure there was, there was no mistake in the copying of the DNA. And they're lifeless chemicals. And boy, they're so efficient. They go through this, you know, just zipping along in a, a fraction of a second. These things are continually doing their work the whole time. And the rate of copying errors is down to about 1 in 10 billion. Okay, now what does this have to do with evolution? How do they know how to do that? And where did this mechanism come from? Evolutionists believe that the very first living thing had no DNA. It had some unknown system, and later it evolved into DNA. It evolved because there was no error correcting mechanism. But then later, because there were errors, an error correcting mechanism evolved because of errors that didn't get corrected. Well, you know, the details of this are enough to blow my mind. I know we read God's word and we're amazed at his, his magnificence. I look at this and I'm amazed at his magnificence too. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. If I were writing that verse, I'd add about another half a verse saying, y'all ought to look through a microscope too. Oh, this is amazing that the evolutionists believe this elaborate, at least three-step error-correcting mechanism. It actually has the capability of remanufacturing that whole defective segment of DNA. Snip this out, manufacture another one, put it in, make sure it all fits, then zip it all back together. The evolutionists have to believe that this was later added to DNA by one copying mistake at a time. The error-correcting mechanism was added because of errors that didn't get corrected by an error-correcting mechanism. And now the error-correcting mechanism is there and it works great, except when an error has to creep in to have evolution happen. There's a system built into cells not to encourage but to prevent evolution. And of course, the theistic evolutionists, they have bought into the evolutionary lie and they say, well, yeah, I know we've got this error-correcting mechanism in there. Well, God must have overridden it so many millions and billions of times just because he loves evolution so much. He really wanted evolution to happen. So the very mechanism he made to prevent it, he said, well, never mind, never mind, temporarily. Let me go ahead and make some changes in there. You can believe it, but it's not science, it's faith. So let me give you a few examples of things in nature that are extremely improbable because they go against what nature shows. One of them is the fact that in plants, there are minerals that are extracted from the soil. Anybody in here ever find out that you have an iron deficiency? So what do you do? You go to the hardware store and get some iron bolts and eat them, right? <laughs> Doesn't do you any good. You can't take metallic iron. You've got to get it from plant sources. Well, um, you know, it sure is lucky for us. Our ancient ancestors would have involved only five or six chemicals, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and, uh, you know, maybe along the way we're going to have some iron and maybe along the way we're going to have some um, calcium and so forth. 
But at the beginning, there would have been almost no elements in the first living thing. And so somehow it came up with something like DNA so it could reproduce. And somewhere along the way, as the plants are evolving off this way and the animal kingdom is evolving off this way, which includes us, the animal kingdom suddenly evolves this need for molybdenum and manganese and calcium and magnesium and all of this stuff. Oh, we need this stuff. We can't just go eat the dirt. We can't get it out of there. Where do we get it? From plants. Plants go and they root through the dirt and they've got a mechanism in there where they can grab one iron atom and bring it in, get another iron atom, bring another iron atom in. They can achieve a concentration of chemicals that's up to 10,000 times as high as what's in the soil. Now, in nature, things move from concentration to randomness. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. Everything kind of flows outward from greater concentration to lesser concentration, but yet the plants go exactly the opposite. This is not in accordance with what evolution would lead you to predict. Evolution would figure it's going to go according to nature. It's going to randomize. Plants are anything but random. It is so lucky for us that just as us, as we in the animal kingdom evolved the need for calcium, the plants decided, I'm going to go get some calcium out of the soil in case somebody wants to eat me later. <laughs> you need about uh, at least 30 different elements that are found in the soil. Fortunately for us, lucky accident of evolution, the plants furnish all of those things. If not, well, we would die of various kinds of vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies. So since there's a very low probability of randomness, that would indicate a very high probability of design. Mm -hmm. Well, I showed you last week Darwin's quote about the eye. He said that, I know it seems very improbable, but let me make up a story for you and see, I'm so smart, my story must be true. I saw something on TV one time. I would have laughed if I wasn't screaming at the TV so hard. Hey, you idiots! They talked about Darwin's scenario. They said that way back when there must have been some kind of a worm that, of course, didn't have any sort of eye. But the worm was just, and every now and then it would come out above the soil, and there was this warmth on its head, and it would turn its head toward the warmth, and that was the sunlight. And gradually, it developed a little hardened spot on its head as it reproduced and its descendants reproduced. Got a little hardened spot, and then the hardened spot deepened into a pit. And the pit filled in with mucus and it developed a clear coating over the top, which is the beginning of the eye. And somewhere along the way, it started to evolve a brain, and it started to evolve an optic nerve and, and all of this stuff. And I was laughing, but I was screaming at the TV at the same time, you idiots, because they've never looked at what are the intricacies of the eye. This is a diagram of the human eye with the various things in it. I want to focus just at the back on the retina, on the optic nerve, on the, the eye cells at the back. The retina is a multi-megapixel receiver that's 10 million times better able to deal with changing light conditions than the best camera that there is. And it's got an incredibly high concentration of cells, very, very, very sharp resolution. The light hits it and it triggers a cell, and then we see things because of that, right? It's not quite that simple. As the light comes in and it hits one cell at the back of the eye, the, cell, the eye doesn't want to overload the brain with unnecessary information. It's all electrical, and the, the eye is programmed in case you have an electrical disturbance, just a little blip. Nah, don't send that back to the brain. There has to be blips from adjacent cells, adjacent rods and cones, before the eye will even bother to pre-process it. Then it's got to interpret the colors on those things, and it's got to put it together into a group, and it sends it down the optic nerve, where it eventually winds up in the brain and it's all processed. So somebody did an analysis of the amount of visual information that your eyes take in continually. If you sweep your eyes across the room for one second, the amount of visual information you take in, approximately 20 years ago, the, the world's fastest computer was a Cray supercomputer. At the time, that information you took in in one second would have bogged down a Cray supercomputer for about 100 years. Well, granted, they're about 1,000 times faster now. So it might only bog it down for a month or so. I just stopped the world's fastest supercomputer for a month just by looking around the room. So nowadays we have computers that are pretty fast. It started out, they would work in milliseconds, and then we went to the next generation microseconds, and whoa, nanoseconds. And now we have supercomputers that are just a few nanoseconds. 
Well, if you go a thousand times faster than that, that's picoseconds. If you go a thousand times faster than that, femtoseconds, that's your eye. And we're working with 7,000 year old technology. This has been in the eye since the very beginning and it's you know, roughly a million times faster than the fastest processor known. And it's an accident of evolution, as is the brain. The brain is the most organized assemblage of matter known in the entire universe, but it's an accident of evolution. Another little trivial thing that has to do with probabilities, nature tends toward randomness. So anybody ever get thirsty and you put a straw down and you drink and you suck it up out of there? Okay, suppose that you're the top of a tree and you want to get a drink. How are you going to do that? Well, if you stand up on the ledge of a building that's like 40 or 50 stories high, 40 or 50 feet high, and there's a bucket of nice ice water down there, or some nice bark root beer, get a real long straw, metal straw so it won't collapse, and you start sucking on it, you'll never get a drink. Whoops. <laughs> you'll never get a drink. Because it's not that the suction pulls it up, it's that the air pressure pushes it up. The maximum height you can get out of a column of water is about 30 to 32 feet. And since the top of the tree needs water, the tree is never going to grow more than about 30 feet high. Is that the limit on trees? No. Why not? They got pumps. Trees have pumps that is actually pushing the liquids up to the top. This goes contrary to what nature does. This is far out of equilibrium with, with its surroundings. This is something that you just have a really difficult time explaining in, term of, in terms of thermodynamics, concentration of energy. It goes the wrong way to fit with random probabilities. So once again, a low probability of randomness equals a high probability of design. And here's another one that's it's cute. Anybody saw Finding Nemo? Okay, um, the skunk clownfish doesn't get stung by the sea anemones that it uh, swims around in. It's not immune. If it gets stung, then you know it's going to die too. But the reason that it's able to get along is because it brings scraps of food. The anemone is an animal. I hope that I never have an anemone as my enemy. That would be bad. Uh, but anyway, the, the little skunk clownfish brings along the food and it drops scraps to the anemone and in return the anemone does not sting it and the little clownfish hides among its tentacles so it doesn't get eaten by other things. What's the probability that all of this would happen just by random chance? And then there's a picture of a walking stick and it looks like a stick, right? Okay. Why is it that way? Is it because it needs to look like that? No, it's because it has DNA that controls all of its body structures and it's all pre-programmed in there. It's going to take the same elements you and I have, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, molybdenum, manganese, and all those, and arrange them in a specific way to make it look like that. It doesn't gain that capability because it needs it. Its capability is there because it's programmed into the DNA. I keep using the word program because I'm a programmer and I know it takes intelligence to put programming into something. So these guys blend perfectly with their environment, not because they need camouflage, because it's programmed into their DNA. That is kind of hard to explain when you have something like a rock. The oyster fish looks like rocks. Well, the rock supposedly has been the same for billions of years. All right. But the walking stick looks like the trees and the trees have been evolving. So the walking stick's evolving to match the trees all along the way. Boy, what's the probability there? It's incredibly low. So either the two kinds of DNA evolved independently and they just happened to fit together or else they were designed that way. I want to show you another thing. This is a clip from the internet. You can go to www.ted.com and search for cuttlefish. This is one of the coolest things I've ever seen about camouflage. It's a video clip. Is it loud enough for everybody? Dr. Edith Witter, she's 
now like the Ocean Research and Conservation Association, was able to come up with a camera that could capture some of these incredible animals, and that's what you're seeing here on the screen. That's all bioluminescent, so like I said, just like fireflies. There's a flying turkey under the <laughs> 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 I don't know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geologist by training, uh, but I love that. Uh, and you see, some of, the, some of the bioluminescence they used to avoid being eaten, some they used to attract prey, but all of it, from an artistic point of view, is just positively amazing. And a lot of what goes on inside, there's a fish with glowing eyes, pulsating eyes. Some, some of the colors are designed to hypnotize. These lovely patterns. And then this last one, one of my favorites, this pinwheel design, just absolutely amazing, every single time. That's the unknown world. And today, we've only explored about 3%, 3% of what's out in the ocean. Already, we found the world's highest mountains, world's deepest valleys, underwater lakes, underwater waterfalls. A lot of that we shared with you from the stage. And in a place where we thought no life at all, we find more life, we think, in diversity and density than the tropical rainforest, which tells us that we don't know much about this planet at all. There's still 97%, and either that 97% is empty or just full of surprises. So I want to jump up to shallow water now and look at some creatures that are positively amazing. The cephalopods, head flips. As a kid, I knew them as calamari most of them. So this is an octopus. This is the work of Dr. Roger Hamlin at the Marine Biological Lab. And just fascinating how, how cephalopods can, with their eyes, incredible eyes, sense their surrounding, look at light, look at patterns. Here's an octopus moving across the reef, finds a spot to settle down, curls up, and then disappears into the background. Tough thing to do. In the next bit, we're going to see a couple of squid. These are squid. Now, males, when they fight, if they're really aggressive, they turn white. And these two males are fighting. They do it by bouncing their butts together, which is an interesting <laughs> concept. Now, here's a male on the left and a female on the right. And now, the male has managed to split his color, his coloration, so that the female only always sees the kinder, gentler squid in him. And the males are the <laughs> We're going to see it again. Let's take a look at it again. Watch the coloration, white on the right, brown on the left. He takes a step back, so he's keeping off the other males by splitting his body and he comes up on the other side. Bingo. And I'm told that's not just a squid phenomenon with males, so that's not that good. Cuttlefish, I love cuttlefish. This is a giant Australian cuttlefish, and there he is, his droopy little eyes up here. But they could do pretty amazing things too. Here we're going to see one backing into uh, crevice and, and watch his watch his tentacles. He just pulls them in, makes them look just like algae. It disappears right into the background. Positively amazing. Here's two males fighting. Once again, they're, they're smart enough. These cephalopods, they know not to hurt each other. But look at the patterns that they can do with their skin. Okay, just an amazing thing. Here's an octopus. Sometimes they don't want to be seen when they move because predators can see them. And here's this is this guy actually can make himself look like a rock. And looking at his environment, can actually slide across the bottom using the waves and the shadows so he can't be seen. He just blends right into the, his motion blends right into the background. The moving rock trick. So we're learning lots new from the shallow water, still exploring that deep, learning lots from the shallow water. And there's a good reason why. I mean, the shallow water is full of predators. Here's a barracuda. And if you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom. And you see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. Here's some algae in the foreground. And an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Roger spooked him, so as he took off, a cloud of ink lands. And when he lands, the octopus says, look, I've been seen. Best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's bluffing. Let's do backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it to me. I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color. Watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal. Can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch him blend right into the selfie. One, two, three. And now he's gone and so am I. Thank you very much. That's a great website. They've got all sorts of cool stuff on there. But you have to ask, each, ask yourself, how probable is, is it that that could evolve by random chance?
you know, the algae evolved to look a certain way, and this guy evolved the ability to look just like algae or coral or anything he needs to. He can, he can look like a rock. What's the probability? If it's extremely low, therefore, that must mean that there's a very high probability that there is an intelligence behind all of this. And here's another interesting thing that people just have to overlook. There are birds that will fly, uh, they migrate every year, and some of them go thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. The, I believe it's the golden plover, goes from the tip of Alaska down to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America. It's something like 10,000 miles over open ocean. And they bulk up before their flight. Uh, they get up to about two and a half ounces. <laughs> That's bulking up for these birds. And they fly over open ocean for day after day after day. They can fly through the clouds. They can fly at night. They can fly in the daytime. We're not quite sure how they are able to navigate there's a lot of speculation that somehow they use the Earth's magnetic field. Well, here's a problem for the evolutionists who think this is an accident. According to them, the Earth's magnetic field has changed directions a bunch of times. So how come the birds didn't get confused and, oh, I've got to go this way instead, and go fly off over open ocean and eventually tire out and drown? But they don't. They know exactly where to go. And then the evolutionists also believe that the continents have rearranged themselves over slow, steady, gradual processes over millions of years. And when birds supposedly evolved 225 million years ago, the continents were a whole lot different than they are now. So somehow the birds, little bird brains, have evolved along with the continents' motion so that every year they get it right. If they're off by one-tenth of one degree, flying that far, they're going to miss land and they're going to end up in the ocean and eventually they get tired and they'll fall in the ocean and drown, but yet they get it right year after year after year after year. And here's an interesting thing that uh, at my old church one time, one of the uh, assistant pastors talked about this. The birds fly in V formation. Does anybody know what that accomplishes for them? Airstream. The airstream. If a bird is flying by himself, he just is going to run a certain distance and run out of energy, but they take turns. The leader is the one that's, causing, that's breaking up the air and making it easier for all of the other ones behind. And then after a while, the leader's getting tired. He drops back to the end. The next bird comes up, and then after a while, he gets tired. The next one comes up, and they can fly about 26% farther as a group than they could individually. So, of course... Um, my friend, one of my former assistant pastors, he was talking about geese, and he said they're continually honking to encourage the leader, honk, honk. So he, he turned to the pastor and said, Pastor, honk. <laughs> we ought to do that to Brother Rusty, honk. <laughs> but how do they know to do this? And then how did their little bird brains evolve the ability to continually match with the Earth's magnetic field and the rearrangement of the continents, unless maybe it's not that old, and also, maybe it didn't evolve. Maybe it's something that's built into their brains. What's the probability? Extremely low for random processes, which means extremely high for design. Am I proving to you that there's an intelligent God? No, but I'm trying to show you that there's a very high probability there's got to be an intelligence. And then here's another extremely powerful, perhaps the most powerful argument for design in nature. There are certain machines that you have to have all of the parts there in order for it to work at all. For instance, a mousetrap. If you want to have a functioning mousetrap, you're going to have to have at the least a base, a spring, a latch, a hammer, and a trigger, and then some kind of bait. But if you leave off any one of those parts, it's no longer a mousetrap. Now it's a pile of junk. So Michael Behe, that wrote the book I've referred to, Darwin's Black Box, calls this irreducible complexity. With your car, you could take, out, take off the trunk, take off the body of the car, take out the radio. But eventually, you're going to come to a point where if you leave out one more part, it's no longer a car, it's a pile of junk. Oh, that kind of thing is all throughout nature. It's all throughout living cells. And along the way, if you're going to try to have this evolve, it's got to do something. Because every structure in a living thing costs something. It costs energy. It costs resources. So in order for it to be useful, it's got to do something. Maybe not its final function, but it's got to do something. So, let's see. This is the system that prevents you from bleeding to death when you cut yourself. You're a pressurized, liquid-filled system. If you take a, a water balloon that's pressurized and you puncture it, is it going to stop leaking? 
No, but yet you do. You quit leaking. Because you've got a whole mechanism inside you that's uh, called the blood coagulation cascade. And there's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 30 or so chemicals involved in this thing. And there's feedback loops and there's feed ahead loops. And you've got factors and cofactors and all of these things. And you know what happens if any one of those is not there? You either bleed to death or you die of blood clots. This system is irreducibly complex, and boy, it's got a lot of parts to it. You leave out any one of them, your ancestors died. And yet this system, which every single vertebrate has, no invertebrates have. Where did it evolve from? It's an irreducibly complex system. Every single part has to be there at the same time. Otherwise, it just is not going to work. Now, this one is actually not irreducibly complex, but I'm going to show you in a minute where it is. But as a programmer, I looked at this and I said, whoa, is that cool? Our bodies have the ability to produce 10 billion distinct types of antibodies. When you have various kinds of infections and poisons and so forth come in, your body identifies those things with antibodies, and then the immune system attacks those things and destroys them. Uh, some scientists were curious, and they made new poisons that didn't exist in nature, and they injected them into a rabbit, and the rabbit immediately made antibodies for them. Okay, there are 10 billion distinct types of antibodies. Does anybody remember that number I said of the base pairs in your DNA? Three billion. Well, wait. If every single one of them was used for antibodies, you only got three billion. There's 10 billion distinct types of antibodies. How does this work? Oh, the programming is incredible. There are four different gene segments that's only a very tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of your DNA. On segment one, you got 250 gene segments. Segment two is 10. Segment three is six. Segment four is eight. It's kind of like a uh, Chinese cafeteria, Chinese restaurant, where you take one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. With just this tiny, tiny, tiny little portion of your DNA, you can make 10 billion distinct type of antibodies. Oh, people drool over this kind of thing. Computer programmers, they say, man, I wish I could have thought of that. <laughs> well, sure, this is just random chance, right? This is better than the best computer program anybody's ever come up with. Now, this is where the irreducible complexity comes up. Once you made the antibodies, you've got to do something with them. These are the red flags. They attach to poisons and so forth, saying, hey, immune system, come get this thing that I'm attached to, destroy it. So if you're going to use these things, you have the antibody, which is on the outside of a cell that manufactured it, and it's attached with this particular type of oily patch, and there's a messenger system that's going back and forth. The antibody's got this little shape on it. So stuff bumps against it and goes away. It says, nah, 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 nah. Something bumps against it. It fits. It sends a message down to the cell, down there saying, hey, 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 make a lot more like me. We got an invader. Boop, 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 boop. And the cell gets going and it cranks out bunches and bunches and bunches of these in response to the signal from that one. So this is an irreducibly complex system because you're going to have a multi-stage messenger system and a manufacturing apparatus. And then you've got to have the antibody attachment system out there. If you leave out any one of those, you can't fight off the infections. You've got to have every part there all along from the very beginning in order for it to work at all. So um, what's the probability that this is random? Hmm. Even at the very beginning, if the first living thing came along and it died, it's going to be producing, uh, before it dies, it's going to be producing wastes all the time. Got to get them out of there. Well, um, if you have a multi-celled organism coming along somewhere along, along the way and one cell dies, that cell is garbage. It's got rotting stuff on the inside of it. Now you've got to get rid of it. There are some built-in components in cells. One is called vacuoles, which allow it to expel trash. Another one is called a lysosome, which is nicknamed a suicide sac. If a cell dies, it's got these very corrosive enzymes inside. The lysosome breaks apart, and this thing goes, and it digests the cell from the inside out, and it's no longer garbage. It's little pieces which are able to be flushed out. Why are these things there? Because they're programmed into the DNA. But at the beginning, there was no DNA. So somewhere along the way, this had to gradually evolve, right? No, you have to have this in order for the cell to maintain its survival, and you have to cell maintaining its survival in order for this to come along. It's another one of these irreducibly complex systems. Bacteria that are swimming around inside of your intestines, these guys 
Um, th this was astonishing back in the 1950s. The first person studying this under very, very, very strong microscopes was looking at the bacteria. They swim around by these little um, hair-like things called flagella. And the person was curious. He said, if I grab that flagellum, is the bacteria just going to vibrate? Bacteria began to spin. He said, what? So now we've got scanning, tunneling, electron microscope pictures of the bacteria, and we found out this is an electric motor. It's a better designed electric motor than anything human beings have ever come up with. It's got all the ro parts, the rotor, stator, commutator, brushes, bushings. And it's also got a 30 to 1 gearbox up there, and the motor's individually reversible. It's an ion-driven ion -driven brushless stepper motor. We invented those about 25 years ago. Well, this is 7,000-year-old technology. Every, uh, all of these little bacteria, they've got a better motor than anything human beings have ever come up with. As far as we could tell, it's just about zero friction. We wish we could make something like that. But this is an accident of evolution. And you're about to see a little video on the bombardier beetle. Also, Gordon, if you ever need anything, Gordon is the get it guy for you. Gordon brought some bombardier beetles, and y'all could see them after we're finished. Uh, the bombardier beetle has got a defense mechanism, which earned it its nickname of bombardier. It's Brachinus cherniki. They live out in the woods. I didn't realize there were any around here, but Gordon was able to get a couple of them. They've got a mechanism where they produce a mixture of very concentrated chemicals, stinky chemicals, concentrated hydrogen peroxide, 10 times the concentration you can get in a drugstore, and also hydroquinone. When you mix these things together, they have the potential to explode. So this little critter is continually manufacturing these things, and it's got two storage chambers. And if it's threatened, it's got two little gun barrels on its rear end, and it can point them, and it can then inject a little bit of this into some reaction chambers, some firing tubes, and it's got glands that can produce two other enzymes, peroxidase and catalase. And when you mix those in, bam. So I want you to see a video. This is from Dr. Joe Martin, who's a, a friend of mine. And uh, he shows a lot more details about this. And this may be where we'll end up for the night. Yeah, we're going to show this clip, and that's probably it for the night. Now, if any one of these parts was missing millions of years ago, the beetle blows up.
scientists have now put that explosion in slow motion. And it's like, it's like about a thousand sequential little explosions, but they're so fast, all we need is one pop. And so you think, well, why would that be? Well, that was curious to some scientists that studied this little bug. A lot of them at Cornell University and some other places. And what they discovered was that if it was just one big pop, the, the little bug, if he's shooting like a spider, let's say over here, uh, and he goes, oh, bang, shoots it, he's going to pop himself right out of it, like lighting a burner on a jet engine. But he's out of it. But as long as it is a sequential explosion with his little legs, he can hang on. And how would evolution explain a sequential explosion? This little bug messes with all the theories of evolution. There is no way a slow, gradual process is going to produce this bug. There's no way uh, even the newest theories of evolution, like comes away with equilibrium, which means evolution happens very fast. Well, there's no way that will explain this little bug. I began to realize, how could this particular little animal, for instance, evolve? Uh, it needed all of its parts. It needed everything there all at once, or you just don't have the animal. And my stomach started to turn. <laughs> I really want to be honest. And my wife would tell you, my stomach turned for five years. It took a five-year struggle for me to begin to flip the way I think from thinking in an evolutionary way to thinking in more this animal, or little creature, little bug, whatever, was created uh, fully formed, just like it is. Because that went against everything I'd ever learned. Exploration too. Where okay, that's probably a good point for us to stop tonight because I don't want to have you guys say, that guy went on too long, I ain't going back. But next week we'll continue on um, talking not only about the design in nature, but that implies there's a designer, okay, well, who is it? This is where intelligent design stops. It says there's some intelligence. I'm going to tell you who the intelligence is. It's the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ who made everything. So next week my plan is to talk about how do we know the Bible is right as compared to any other book in the world. So shall we stop there?